I assume yes. No one's yes. playing. Okay, okay, thank you. All right. So um, what I want to do today is give you a little bit of background on um, modern machine translation technologies and how they look, how they work. Um, I promise I won't have any math, even though um, you know there's a lot of math behind it. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about these advances in uh, machine translation and what their implications are for uh, building um, machine translation tools for endangered languages or for languages where we don't have a lot of data. And then again, I want to talk a little bit about mobilizing the archive. So going back to background and the whole intuition behind how can we actually make machines um, translate between one language and the other. Um, this whole thing started right after the Second World War um, when Warren Weaver said famously that, you know, when I look at an article or a sentence in Russian, what, what, what I think is that this is not really Russian. This is, this was, the intent was for it to be written in English, but it, something happened, some blender happening or some, um, some encryption happened. And then uh, this English sentence has been encoded into some straight symbols. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to decode uh, what the original meaning was after this noise was added. Um, and again, this is behind uh, this idea of deciphering. So maybe we can actually automatically recreate the process that Champollion fo uh, followed when uh, he deciphered the uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics uh, by virtue of just having parallel text. So in the Rosetta Stone, there were three sections that you see here. On top, you had the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. In the middle, you had the Egyptian demotic script. And these two scripts, uh, we had lost the knowledge of reading them. But then on the bottom part, we had essentially the same text in ancient Greek, which thankfully we were able to decipher. We, we knew how to understand. And by virtue of just having parallel text, uh, we were able to find out uh, what all of these uh, beautiful um, uh, scribbles meant. So, and I want to convince you that this is something that you can also very easily do uh, with just a few examples. So if you walked into a McDonald's in New Zealand, you might see something like this, uh, where they give you uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven parallel sentences in Maori and in English. So if you want to order a flat white, then you'll say he mo wai maku. Um, or if you want to order a cappuccino, you say hi cappuccino maku. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciation in Maori. But um, the interesting thing here is that um, if you want to order, um, I don't know, uh, if you want to order a large cappuccino, uh, just by looking at these simple, these seven examples, you can actually figure out how to do this because you have the words uh, that you need. You can figure out the proper word ordering in Maori and so on. So this is something that humans can do. I always have my students, uh, when I teach the machine translation class, uh, try to create some Maori sentences and, uh, you know, usually uh, everybody gets it right almost immediately. So um, if humans can do this, then maybe we can do the same thing. And that brings me to data-driven methods for uh, automatic translation. So uh, let me just try to give you an overview of the four ways of how we can achieve this um, in the, from a uh, bird's eye uh, point of view. The first one is to just figure out the rules. Um, so we're going to do a linguistic analysis of one language uh, and then linguistic analysis of the target language. And we're going to figure out uh, what syntactic transformations need to happen when we go from one language to the other. Uh, and then uh, we'll have the rules that will tell us how to replace words or phrases in one language into the other. The pros of this is that it can be complicated and sophisticated in design, which means um, it can, but the things that it can cover, the rules that this approach can cover um, will actually work uh, if we've done proper linguistic analysis. But it's hard to handle every contingency and, and cover all of the phenomena that are present in both languages. And unfortunately, as you can imagine, we don't have enough linguists in order to build such tools for all languages and even worse, for all language pairs, right? So if we have 6,500 languages um, in the world today, we'd need 65 squared um, such rule systems uh, in order to build 
translation systems between every pair of languages. Um, another approach is if you have a translation memory, such as those that uh, professional translators uh, often keep, then a simple approach is just to look up uh, the most similar sentence in a database and then use that to provide the translation or to provide a, a skeleton for a translation. Uh, that's easy to understand, that's straightforward, but then it has the problem that you cannot easily generalize to new sentences. You're restricted to what is in your translation memory. So uh, what has been uh, the bulk of machine translation research up until, you know, from the 90s, up until 2013 or 2014, uh, was uh, what is called phrase-based translation. Now, the idea is that we're going to break up sentences in small chunks, and then we're going to look up translations for them, and I'll show you what I mean by that, and then we're going to combine these small chunks in the target language in order to create uh, the output sentence. Now, this is uh, better than the previous approaches. It can generalize better as long as the small chunks that we have in a new sentence are also covered. Um, but uh, this combination of these small chunks into the target language is hard. Uh, so um, it, these models um, find it hard to generate fluent sentences, and they will make mistakes on syntax and uh, morphological agreement and so on, morphosyntactic agreement and so on. And then that brings me to the current state of the art, which is neural MP. And the idea is uh, we're going to feed the input, which is any sentence that we want to translate. We're going to feed it into a probabilistic model, and that model will predict the output translation word by word. There's, no, there's not going to be any explicit modeling of syntax or any explicit modeling of uh, word for word translation or any explicit segmentation in chunks or phrases or words, um, we are going to just rely on a model that will just we'll train it to predict an output word by word. Um, the advantage of this is that if we have enough data to train this model, or if we do some of the tricks that I'll show you later, um, we're going to be much better at syntactic correctness, at fluency, and at leveraging the whole input context, the whole source language context, in order to produce a fluent translation. At the same time, uh, because these approaches, these models are very opaque, they are very much like a black box and we don't have knobs to control them like we did with the other ones, um, then they can make sometimes big mistakes. They can just drop content and just leave it untranslated. Or they can hallucinate new content and produce a fluent, um, a very nice looking fluent output uh, in the target language, which will be completely irrelevant to the source sentence. So there are these uh, big mistakes that can happen. Now, these data-driven methods in general encompass both using translation memories and these phrase-based ideas and neural, the neural approaches of today. Now, all of these obviously rely on the availability of data. So what we traditionally need in order to build such tools is Wait. parallel corpora. Yes? Was there a question or...? No, okay. Um, <laughs> if there's someone there, uh, do, if, you, uh, if you mute yourself. Or, yes? Okay. So, uh, again, so what we need in order to build such tools is parallel corpora. That means we need translated sentences between the source and the target languages. And this can be uh, built by professionals or be built by hobbyists. They can, build, they can be built by governments or newspapers or companies or whatever. And you see here in the graph the availability of such parallel corpora um, over different language pairs. These are all translation uh, parallel corpora between English and other languages. And you can see how uh, there are some languages where we have a lot of data, more than we actually even need, uh, like in French, in German, in Spanish, in Chinese. But then there's also a lot of languages that are very, very low resource, um, like Yoruba or Sindhi or Hawaiian and so on. Now, all of these data-driven methods um, operate in the following way. We're going to have the parallel corpus uh, that gives us examples of translations between the source and the target language. Then we're going to have a training process that will read in this parallel corpus and then create somehow this probabilistic translation model, which will be able to give us a translation, a Y uh, in the target language, given 
a, a source sentence. Right? So this is uh, the probability here, which I think is the only math I have in the presentation, is basically telling us that we're going to have probability of a target sentence given the source sentence. Okay, And then uh, when we have this model and it's trained, uh, then we, when we have a new sentence uh, in the source language, then we can use that model to produce uh, an output uh, translation. All right. Now, before 2014, here's what we did. We would start with a parallel corpora and we would split the different parallel sentences into phrases. And then we had some models that would figure out which phrase is a translation of what phrase. So in this uh, simple example that you see here between German and English, uh, naturally uh, corresponds to naturally, or of course, in this example, hat corresponds to has, or John corresponds to John, uh, spas um, corresponds to fun with the, and so on. So now we have these chunks and uh, we collect them uh, through all of the big corpus that we have of parallel sentences. So now we, by having those parallel phrases now, we can create a phrase table. And then what we're going to do is we're also going to have some other um, additional components, like a, a model to do the reordering in the target language, which is needed here, um, or a target language model that will tell us which uh, combinations of phrases are actually fluent in the target language. So then when we have a new sentence, Let's say we had this. Now we have a new sentence like Maria no dio una bofetada a la bruja verde. Um, then we're going to split down into chunks. We're going to look up possible translations for each of these chunks in our phrase table. So for Maria, we only found Mary. For Dio, we found give. For Una, we found A. For a la bruja verde, for the A there, we found two possible translations. We found both to and by. And then we also do this for longer uh, chunks. So we have a chunk, for example, no dio, that we find the translation in our phrase table that says did not give. Or for una bofetada, we find a slap, okay? And now we have all of these possible sequences if we combine these uh, chunks um, that could be good translations. So then the only thing that we have to do is select the best path through all of these possible options that gives us the most fluent output in English in this example. And then we would follow that green path and then that's what we would return in our uh, final model. Now, this approach actually worked. It, it was what powered Google Translate up until 2017, 2018, um, but it has some problems. So I don't know if you've seen this uh, Vauqua tri triangle before where the idea is if we have a source language uh, and we want to go into a target language, then probably the best possible way to do this, and maybe what humans do, is we're going to go to some hypothetical interlingua, some hypothetical semantics space, where we take the source language, we understand what it means, and we somehow represent it. And then from that um, latent representation of the meaning of the source sentence, we will then uh, convey that meaning into the target language. Now, a simple word-for-word uh, -word translation doesn't really capture the whole meaning, for example, right? So it's very kind of like at the low um, part of this triangle. This phrase-based machine translation that we did before 2014 that I show you here, again, uh, it's closer to meaning because we capture phrases and things like that, but it doesn't really go uh, that far up. It's still symbolic. It doesn't really capture me. And that brings me to the neural era, the, the, the current, the post-2014 work that actually, um, it's not super close to the interlingua either, but it's much higher than this phrase-based MT is uh, because you could argue that the way that we represent now our inputs and our outputs uh, is kind of like way more general and it's somehow an interlingua that we just don't understand. So let me just delve into this and, um, and then I'm going to pause for questions after I explain this. So the main idea is um, to represent sentences or utterances or even whole documents in, in the end uh, as a vector or as a sequence of vectors. A vector is just a bunch of numbers, 
okay? So if we have a sentence that says this is an example, then we're going to somehow obtain a bunch of numbers that hopefully tell us something about this sentence. Or even better, if we have a sentence, again, like this is an example, um, we are going to represent it as a sequence of vectors. Again, a sequence of just a bunch of numbers, okay? Um, we don't know what these numbers mean, uh, but we do hope that they will somehow capture um, the, the sentence, the meaning of the sentence, okay? Um, so now, our general model, this probabilistic uh, neural model, what it's going to do is, given a source sentence, like, I hate this movie, uh, we're going to look up uh, the vectors that we have for every word, okay? Again, basically, we're going to have a bunch of numbers for every word, and what we find, in fact, is that these numbers do tend to capture semantics. So the vector for movie and the vector for film are going to be quite similar. They're not going to be exactly the same, um, but they're going to be very similar in terms of you know their numbers. Um, if you think of a vector, a vector is like an arrow, and uh, the arrow for movie and film kind of points in the same general direction, whereas the arrow for uh, the same like for house and um, apartment, they also point in the center, the same direction, but they're not. It's not the same direction as movie and film. Okay, so then uh, if we have these representations for every word, then what we're going to have is some complicated function that reads in all of these vectors and extracts essentially combination features and figures out how to combine all of these words and produces. Uh, some other intermediate representation. And then from that intermediate representation, then we can add some extra components that will give us a probability of what is uh, the possible uh, word to translate, right? The, the next possible word to produce in our output. So then we're going to, in order to generate a translation, what we're going to do is we're going to query this function over and over in a regressive manner. And I'll show you what, what this means in a minute. But basically, uh, we're going to keep querying this function to generate the first word of the translation. Then we're going to generate the second word of the translation, and so on. OK? Uh, so let me show you how this looks. If we have this uh, sentence, the cat sat on the mat, OK? We're going to uh, take it. And then we're going to represent our input, again, with just a bunch of vectors, all right? Then we're going to have some function that will encode this, these vectors and combine them together with many different ways um, and then produce intermediate representations, okay? Again, these are just a bunch of numbers and uh, the encoder just really just does a bunch of math by multiplying these vectors with other vectors and so on, okay? Uh, so, but again, now we have these intermediate representations, these green vectors, which now do not only capture, um, you know, they don't, they are informed by the whole sentence. So, um, you know, the vector above sat has been informed by looking at all the other vectors in this sentence. So it, it has some information from the whole context. So now what we want to do is to have this extra component on top that will generate uh, the output translation one, one at a time. And then this decoder also has a vector of its own, again, a just a bunch of numbers, that we'll use to track the state of the generation, the, the state of the translation. And we're going to use it state, compare it to this intermediate representation, and um, figure out, again, we don't do anything by hand. The model learns to do this, um, to where we should be looking at the input when we translate uh, in order to produce the next translation word. So in this example, in the beginning, it will pay more attention to the first word, like to the cat, as opposed to paying attention at the end of the sentence. So by using this attention matrix, um, these attention weights, then we can produce, again, uh, you guessed it, another vector that, represent the re that represents the relevant context uh, that we're going to be using to produce the next word. So now we have this relevant context. We're going to combine it with the current state of the translation and uh, we're going to select the next word to output out of the possible vocabulary. And if our model has been trained properly, it will hopefully select either L or LA, okay? Now, the good thing about this is that in order to learn all of these 
uh, weights, all of these matrices that are hidden here that I don't show, uh, but basically learn the parameters of the model, all we need is examples of input and, uh, and desired output. And we follow this process that it's called back propagation, but doesn't really matter. But the way that you can think about this is that we have randomly initialized parameters in our model in the middle that initially will just produce garbage. But what we do is for every given example of a source sentence and a desired output translation, we're going to give the source sentence to the model. We're going to see what output it gives. We're going to compare it, the output of our model with the desired output. And then we're going to figure out what the differences are. And what we're going to do then is, oh, okay, um, go back and change a little bit of these parameters. This happens automatically so that the next time that the model sees the same input, it will produce a better translation that is closer to the desired one. And if we do this over and over and over and over, over a large amount of data, then the, the model will actually learn the task and it will learn to produce fluent translations that match the input. Uh, it will implicitly model syntax and reordering and all of those things without us giving it explicitly any information about these things. So um, given an input uh, like here in Japanese, Watashi uh, Wakpen um, then the model, the generation will look like this. Given the input, uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to query our function and it will tell us, hey, I think uh, with 96% probability, your first output should be I. So then we output I. And then the next step, we're going to give the function, we have the same input. We now know that we generated I. And we're going to ask it, what is the, what do you think is the next word? And it will tell us, well, with 90% probability, I think the next word is am. With 6% probability, it was, it's was. With 2% probability, it's will, and so on. So we're going to select the one that has the highest probability and output am, and so on and so forth. And that way, we are going to uh, output, if our model is properly trained and produces uh, good probabilities, it will output I am giving a talk a talk and then say, okay, I'm done now. I, I don't think I should generate anymore. And then that's what we're going to output um, with our model. Now, um, the main intuition behind this is that if we have enough data to train this model, then this model will actually be better than anything we had before. Okay. So, um, and then that brings me to the, the main bug here, which is, okay, so far so good. But, you know, this only will still work in high resource settings because um, we do need um, a lot of data to train this or, the, or at least we thought we did up until uh, a couple of years ago. So are there any questions so far um, into kind of like the general idea of how these models work? Okay. All good. Okay. Okay. Great. So. Again, the, now the question is how if, you know, uh, the way I described it, what we need in order to train these models in large amounts is large amounts of parallel data, of translated data. Now, um, here's uh, one very influential idea that's been around for about four years um, that also allows us to take advantage of monolingual data. That means data that are not translated, which are actually in larger abundance than parallel data. And this idea is back translation. So let me show you how this works. Let's say we want to train a system from English to French. We have some amount of parallel data, okay? Maybe it's small, maybe it's big, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we also have a large amount of monolingual data in the target language, right? These are data that just are, you know, they, they have never been translated, but we have access to them. So here's the idea. We're going to first train a model in the opposite direction than the one we want to train. So we're going to train a French to English model. Okay. It's not going to be perfect, um, but it's what we can do is now use this model and then take all of that monolingual data that we have and back translate them and essentially create synthetic translations into English in this example. So now what we have is a much bigger amount of parallel data, some of those on top, 
were created by humans and professional translators, and a, a larger amount of those was created by an automatic system. So this English side in this synthetic parallel data is not great, but the French one is fluent French, right? Uh, it's, it's written by humans. So um, now we're going to combine all of that data together, and now we're going to train the model in the direction that we wanted to train initially, and that's English to French, right? And now it has seen a lot more data, even though there's noise in the synthetically generating English data, this is still um, now doing this actually really, really, really helps the model. And every um, modern machine translation tools uh, leverage untranslated text this way. Um, Google Translate does this. Uh, it leads to large gains in performance. So now that's the first simple thing that we can do if we have access to untranslated data. And I'm going to sum up what all of these mean uh, for our purposes in a minute. Another idea is, well, wait, um, languages are related to each other, right? So what about taking advantage of data from related languages? And that's um, a lot of what my research is on, uh, on cross-lingual transfer. So the main idea is, um, let's say we have a lot of parallel data in Turkish and English, okay? And that means we can actually train a decent model between Turkish and English. Um, but now we don't have a lot of parallel data in Azerbaijani to English. However, we know that Azerbaijani and Turkish are related. They're both Turkic languages. Um, in fact, Azerbaijani speakers can uh, comprehend Turkish speakers more or less when they speak. Um, so what if we just took the pre-trained model that we have, the model that we have on Turkish, and use it to initialize um, our model that we're going to train on whatever little data we have for Azerbaijani. And that's a very simple thing to do. Um, all we need is to have a related language that we can use. And if we do this, um, you can see all of these colorful plots here show how much better we can become from the blue uh, plot. The blue plot uh, at the bottom shows uh, the quality of the empty system that we trained on Azerbaijani to English um, using only the little available Azerbaijani to English data that we have. Uh, and basically, that model outputs garbage. It's just not good at all. But if we use the Turkish system first and then keep training on the little Azerbaijani data that we have, then we can actually reach a system. These are different tries that we did uh, in yellow and red and green and uh, orange um, that actually can produce something useful, something meaningful. Um, and then maybe... Well, why should we only use one related language? Maybe we can uh, do multilingual training and train a single model from, for many, many languages. So here's what this looks. We're going to have a lot of parallel data in many, many languages, like French to English, Portuguese to English, Turkish to English, Belarusian to English, whatever it is. And we're going to treat it as if it's a single data set, right? A single parallel data set. And we're going to train a single model on this. So Google did this um, a couple of years ago uh, at this point in 2019, and they trained this massively multilingual uh, big neural machine translation systems. So let me just play this GIF. I hope it does play there. So basically they used a hundred languages. Let me pause here. And then they showed in the very beginning, what is the translation quality for going between these 103 languages into English, okay? Uh, the higher resource language, uh, the better the quality will be. And you see how the quality drops off uh, when we don't have a lot of data to train a model uh, on just this one language pair. Now, if we train a single multilingual model on all of this data at once, you'll notice here uh, and I forgot to mention, I apologize, that the way that we measure the quality of the systems is through this blue score uh, that just compares the output of the system to to the out, to the translation that a human translator produced. Um, and basically all you need to know is that the higher is better, uh, as almost in any metric. So what you see here, this single multilingual model that has been trained on all of these languages, now it's a little worse for the high resource languages where we have enough data to train a single system. 
but it gets a lot better in all of these languages where we don't have a lot of data to train um, a, a, uh, a single language system. All right. So, and then um, let me play this GIF, 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 I don't know, uh, GIF, where they showed that basically, oh, wait, uh, if we um, increase the size of the model and we use a lot more parameters, you see the first one is 400 million parameters, which, you know, compared to the brain, it's still small. Um, it can do, um, it, you know, it will do a lot better for low resource languages, but it will do worse for high resource languages. But if we increase the size of this model, then it will actually do a lot better in all of the languages. Okay. And you see here the red line and the green line, how we improve significantly upon just using data for a single language pair. So, and then the last thing that we can do is, okay, now Google trained the system on 103 languages. What happens if we want to, uh, you to train a system on a new language that Google hasn't trained the model on? Do I need to do this whole process again by just including the new language and going from scratch? training this whole big multilingual model from scratch? The answer is no. Uh, we can use these pre-trained multilingual models like that Google and Facebook are putting out and adapt them to a new language. So the idea is here, we're going to take this big multilingual model and we're going to fine tune it, basically just do a little bit of training uh, on the language that we care about. Uh, let's say here in this example, is Azerbaijani to English. And that also improves considerably. You can also combine it with back translation and with all these other ideas. You can fine tune on both Turkish to English and Azerbaijani to English, for example, and you can do a lot better. Here, the, the blue in the two graphs, the blue lines are uh, blue scores without this approach, and the red ones are using this adaptation technique, and the model, again, gets a lot better to the point of producing something usable. So, to sum up, Okay, these neural models can natively, uh, through this back translation idea, uh, leverage untranslated data in order to synthesize the amounts of data that we need in order to train those neural models adequately. So, and at the same time, they, they support, they, they provide an easy mechanism for combining data from multiple languages. Because as I told you before, every word just gets represented as a bunch of numbers, okay? So um, if you have the word um, demokratia in Greek and democracy in English, these two, uh, when you look at the letters and the symbols, they look completely different, right? And to the computer, they look like two completely distinct things. But if you represent them as vectors, as a bunch of numbers, and uh, you do this properly, then these numbers will actually be very similar between these two languages. So um, by, pro by representing all of the data that we have as a bunch of numbers, then now all of these uh, look the same to the computer. And that way we can combine data from multiple languages. So uh, by doing so, we can then train a large multilingual model using all of the languages, all, all of the available data that we have, which can then be fine-tuned on the language of your choice with little data. So we don't need uh, basically a ton of data anymore you know, to pull up to, to create a system for a new language. And at the same time, you can do even, you can be smarter about this and use our linguistic knowledge about which languages are related to each other uh, and use data from related languages and do um, better. So this brings me to the implications of what data do we actually need in order to produce a machine translation system for a language that doesn't have one available, okay? Now, obviously, large amounts of translated data are always going to be great to have, and the more you have, the better. But that used to be a hard requirement, and what I'm saying is that anymore, that, that's not anymore the case. We can do pretty well and train a system that is usable with just a little bit of data. Um, so if you have any of the following, you can still do a decent job. Um, you, if you have any amount of text, and again, as always, the more the merrier, um, any amount of text, even untranslated in the language, 
like from Wikipedia, from newspaper articles, from blogs, from wherever. Um, of course, the text needs to be machine readable, and that will bring me to the second part of my talk. Um, well, that I'll just browse through, I'll just go quickly through. Um, or if you have related languages that have data availability, um, either parallel data translated or monolingual, this can be very, very useful. Um, and then, again, as I said, uh, having some parallel data uh, is optional, but it can be very helpful. Um, if you have large amounts of parallel data, then your language is already probably already well represented uh, in these multilingual models. Um, and you know, if you have things like dictionaries, um, they're not particularly useful, but there's some recent work that says, okay, maybe we can bootstrap simple things, we uh, can bootstrap a, a machine translation model by using the information in the dictionaries at the word level and then keep combining them at the phrase and then at the sentence level, uh, but that's still not on par with having actual text in the language. So, um, this is the first part that I that I wanted to talk about. Um, but if you don't mind, Jeanette, please let me know if I spend um, five more minutes to go through the uh, uh, the part about mobilizing the archive. Is that okay, or do you want me to stop here? I'm fine either way. Absolutely, please go on, and I'm sure people will have a few questions. If we can try to aim to finish, um, you know, in 15, 20 minutes, that would be great. Oh, absolutely. I'll aim to finish in seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. Yes. So, um, so again, basically what the takeaway from here is, um, is we need to have at least some amounts of data in the language, not necessarily parallel, but we need text in the language okay and that we need this text to be machine readable it's not enough that you bring me you know uh 10 books in the language i need to be able to somehow provide that information to the computer okay and this brings me to this idea of mobilizing the archive which is not the, that term was um very recently um um i mean people have used it before but uh, stephen bird brought it to the attention of the nlp community very recently, um, we've been working with Stephen for a while, um, but basically the idea is that we, for endangered languages and for languages that just don't have a lot of data, um, at least not a lot of data on the internet uh, or in a machine readable format, that doesn't mean that there's no data out there. Textual data do exist for many such languages, but the problem is that these data are locked away in formats that are not machine readable. Right? So there might be locally published cultural texts, there might be educational materials that um, have been published, or there might be, uh, which will be my focus for the next three years in, in this project, um, linguistic documentation where you know a linguist went to the community, uh, they collected audio, they transcribed some of it, they translated some of it, they analyzed some of it, but then that data has been sitting in a linguistic archive since uh, maybe they published a couple of papers on the language, they published the grammar, but then all of the data that they collected, we are not using um, to build other downstream uh, language technologies. So uh, here's an example so that, that we have looked into. There's paper books, as I said, there's handwritten notes. Uh, here in this example, these are notes in Sangaji uh, by a documentation linguist in Botswana. And um, there might also be PDFs or scans of notes or of books which are not machine readable, like a PDF, at least older PDFs up until uh, 2012 or 2013, uh, these scans were just images, right? So I cannot actually easily go and take the text from a PDF. And we looked very briefly at how many such documents could we find with, and with a very simple search, we found more than 11,000 books on the Internet Archive that are not in the top 100 languages, which is what most of NLP is focusing on these days. Um, and we're actually collaborating now with ILA, uh, an archive uh, for the indigenous languages of Latin America, which is hosted at the University of Texas. And they have basically more than 20,000 documents that linguists produced in the process of documenting more than 100 languages throughout uh, Central America and the Caribbean and, and South America. So what we are trying to do 
is develop optical character recognition models for endangered language texts in order to make all of these data machine readable so we can use them to build language technologies, to build machine translation, to build syntactic analysis, to build uh, voice recognition and so on. Now, um, the problem, as you can imagine, is that state-of-the-art character optical character recognition or OCR tools uh, that have been built without such languages in mind um, are bad, right? So I have this example here from the Library of Congress, which has digitized data. In this example, this is a book with data in Dakota, one of the native languages, um, Native American languages. And um, the OCR, however, that they used was trained on English. And as a result, um, you can see here, it makes uh, a lot of mistakes. Um, there's just, you know, just in the first line, there's more than five mistakes. And in fact, um, no, there's exactly five mistakes. <laughs> and for, you know, four of the five words are wrong, right? It's only the second word, omaka, that is correct. So, um, in fact, if you, uh, we basically found out that some OCR tools only got Unicode support, which is needed for most not uh, very commonly used languages in 2018, which is just two years ago at this point. Um, so what we did is we created a benchmark data set and we looked at three languages. We took a book of Ainu poetry. Ainu is a, um, the language of the indigenous people of Japan that lived there before the Japanese moved in. It's a language isolated, it's super, super interesting. Um, and we had this book that we uh, scanned and uh, did OCR on uh, that had translations between Ainu uh, poetry and it also had the Japanese translations. We also uh, worked in a dialect in a language that's very dear to me, uh, the Greek or dialect of Greek which is spoken in the heel of the boot of Italy. Uh, and we had uh, several books with folk tales that had translations both in Greek and Italian um, that we were able to digitize. And last, we worked on Yakra, a language spoken uh, in Nepal, um, which uses the Devanagari script. Uh, we had uh, three children's books that contained um, the same stories in Yaka, but also in Nepali and also in English. Okay, so we did OCR uh, on these, um, and we actually used uh, the publicly available Google Vision OCR system, which is a general purpose system that can support 60 languages and 29 uh, scripts. And um, this isn't trained on any of the languages that we looked into or any endangered language for that matter, but it supports the scripts that are in our languages, uh, in the data set that we created. And just using this tool out of the box, we get pretty promising results, okay? Uh, the, here we evaluate with word error rate, so lower is better. And you see that in Ainu, because it's a typed book and it only uses very, very basic uh, Latin script characters, um, the word error rate is below 10. That means that more than nine out of 10 words are actually correctly recognized. In Yaka, the, the, the word rate is around 30, which means only about seven of, out of 10 words are correct. So it, the first pass output does recognize the majority of the words correctly. Um, and our idea was that this can be a reliable starting point for post-correction of this output, uh, because there is considerable room for improvement in all these three languages. So um, a lot of these error of the errors that we found after doing an analysis um, was where caused by the specific characteristics of endangered languages. So we had errors because of mixed scripts or because of characters borrowed from other scripts, which cannot be handled uh, adequately uh, by current OCR systems. So Greco uses both Greek and Latin characters. Yaka uses the Devanagari script, but also has some IPA symbols in there to represent glottal stops that are not common in Hindi or Nepali. Um, but these don't get recognized correctly. In addition, endangered languages tend to use diacritics that are part of the standard script, but might be rare in high resource languages. So the underdots that you see here that Greco uses, even though they are part of, um, uh, of the standard Unicode for Latin script, um, there aren't any major languages that use it. Okay. Um, in addition, there's this, um, 
uh, line under the character here in Yaka, I don't remember its proper name, that is also very uncommon uh, in all the other languages that use Devanagari, like Hindi. Uh, so these um, uh, are also incorrectly uh, recognized. So what we suggested is, okay, maybe we can correct just like one or two or 10 pages of these, of these books, which is not, a, I mean, it is effort, but it's not that much of an effort. It took our annotators like a few hours to do these corrections. So um, basically now, um, after we applied our model on top of the OCR output that to learn how to do these corrections, uh, we managed to reduce the word error rate uh, significantly in all three languages. Um, so uh, we had almost more than 50% error reduction in Grico, a 30% reduction in Yaka and so on. So in the end, this means that, and we're still working on this, we're, we actually have some upcoming work where we make this even better. But basically what I'm trying to say is now, if we have non-digitized, non-machine readable text, now we have a pathway towards making that text machine readable so that then we can use it downstream. And yes, uh, out of the box tools like Google Vision OCR provide uh, a decent first pass output, but we can actually do a lot better and make that text cleaner so that we don't have to deal with a lot of noise when we train our models and so on. Um, we actually have put all of the code for this out. Uh, if you have any materials that you want to make machine readable, just reach out or go to that URL. Um, we have clean instructions that tell you how to use the Google OCR to, to obtain the first pass output, uh, how you can create post corrections uh, on that output uh, by hand using a tool that uh, we are also using to create some examples of how we, the, the model should correct the, um, the Google output to make it cleaner. And then uh, we have examples on how to train our model or to train a model similar to ours to do this post correction on, on your language. So to, to summarize, there have been lots of very recent, and I, what I mean by recent um, is that I had to revamp my NLP lecture, my NLP class uh, almost every year these days, uh, because whatever I taught in 2018 is not relevant anymore in 2020. And that means a lot of work, but that means that there's also a lot of excitement because now we can enable really cool things for, for languages that uh, we don't have a lot of data. And a lot of you, um, I know, have access to data. A lot of you have expertise either on the translation community or in the linguistics community. Uh, so um, if you're interested in any sort of collaboration, just reach out to us or reach out to your favorite NLP person. Um, they, will be, uh, they will be aware of all of these exciting developments because, um, you know, um, these, these efforts like pre-training and uh, fine-tuning and all that and making models largely massively multilingual, they keep getting like best paper awards in LP conferences and so on. So um, th all of these things um, basically mean that we can make systems with minimal data and these systems can be, they won't be perfect, they won't be like as good as English-French translation is, but they will be much better than you would expect them to. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll be very, very happy to get questions or just to discuss about whatever you want. Well, thank you so much, uh, Antoni. This was fantastic. I mean, we've heard, uh, um, you know, many times, uh, uh, you know, uh, presentations and lectures on machine translation, but so focused on indigenous languages or languages with very limited data, you made it very, very clear and possible for communities to be able to, you know, start thinking about machine translation, that it can be possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so we uh, completely appreciate this very, very much. <laughs> uh, I do want to, to mention that, I mean, I, I had to skip a lot of slides, but I had a case study recently at a conference. There was a, um, a paper about building Cherokee to English machine translation uh, out of uh, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, there is a big grassroots organization in Africa called Mashakane, where um, like Africans realized, okay, wait, Google doesn't care about us. And I'm sorry, Craig, to, to put it this way. Uh, 
Google hasn't put out, you know, it doesn't support African languages. And I mean, it makes sense. Google didn't have data for these African languages. So people sat down, they created data. They, um, I work with people in Zambia and we collected data from books and stuff like that. And they created this very big community that's very, very active. I highly recommend talking to them or uh, inviting them over. This is this big effort that now we have data in more than 20 African languages from the big ones that you can imagine, like Swahili and Afrikaans and Yoruba in Nigeria, but also, um, you know, what you'd consider, I don't want to say smaller ones because they're still spoken by millions of people, but they are languages that were predominantly oral, which is a big issue. Uh, and literacy is also a big issue, but the, the, you know, the younger people now realize, okay, we can actually sit down, um, write stuff like pay people to 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 just write stuff down or collect whatever is available from missionary texts which unfortunately for many of these languages are the most available uh data to the bible to the quran to anything else we can find and these can be a good starting point to build systems that produce something useful so yeah i'll stop blabbering and take questions sorry so but we yeah, have a couple of hands. Hand. Nicholas uh, has raised his hands first. Tex uh, is uh, next. And may I ask um, uh, someone to take over the um, um, uh, the raising of the hands because I need to leave shortly and I, I, I will just leave you carry on. Jordan, are you on the call? Can you help with the coordination? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Antonis, again. It was wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Janet. Well, thank you very much. It was very insightful. And uh, I, I do have a question, Boo. Uh, I understand that um, all those um, strategies uh, are predicated on the fact that we have English as a private language. Uh, or are there a more multilateral uh multilateral uh, possibilities uh, I mean, this reminds me of i think it was roman jacobson who said uh, something like i speak 23 languages all of them in russian and <laughs> do we not run the risk of speaking uh Grico or chinua in, mm -hmm. in absolutely absolutely um only i mean i had these examples between english because um this is the most easily available parallel language to get data on because it has become the lingua franca for many regions of the world but um it doesn't have to be english and in fact i've done some work where i've shown that english is a bad pivot language because it's an outlier in terms of typology right it has no morphology it has a ton of data it has weird phonology um, you know, English is a bad one, uh, but um, it is what we have. I've done work, so for Greco, we use translations in Italian uh, and in Greek. Uh, for indigenous languages of Latin America, most often the translations that you're going to have are going to be in Spanish, because that's what the most speakers are bilingual in, and that's absolutely fine. Um, the people in Africa have been building French to um, African languages translations, uh, so, it, but it doesn't have to be um, English. Absolutely, I agree that almost always. Unfortunately, the colonial languages are European languages, or they are Indo-European languages. So they have specific characteristics that don't actually match well uh, with other in uh, with other languages, like the polysynthetic languages of the uh, Northwest in Canada and the U.S. Um, but you know, it is what it is, um, and you know when you. Um, we we were doing some research on building, for example, language family specific multilingual models, and I think this has some promise. Um, or you know, using pivoting through multiple languages, if that's what is available, that's also uh, feasible. So, yes, um, yeah, English. <laughs> I hate English, uh, but it is what we have, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tex, it looks like you had a question. Yes. Um, Thanks for a, a great presentation. I, my question is about um, the measurement of quality, mm -hmm. uh, as you referenced blue, and yeah. that has weaknesses. But also, as you get into um, the less frequent 
actively used um, language pairs, it's harder to get translators. And I would imagine also for the comparison. And then also um, maybe as, as you, you go down that, that tail, um, maybe also the translators aren't as critical. The, the translations are more difficult between the pairs. And anyway, you, you get the idea. What can you say about the, um, the ability to measure quality, first in general using blue, but then also that is that is weak, but then also um, maybe, the, maybe it's misleading that the quality for uh, some of these, these combinations is is what we think is good but maybe it isn't that that good because our ability to compare isn't um isn't very good yes um so you're absolutely right um there's a whole like people have done whole phds on how can we measure the quality of machine translation um blue definitely has its issues um there's been a lot of recent suggestions on how we can properly or at least better measure quality, uh, especially in indigenous languages or languages that are high, that have high morphology. Um, I just showed examples in blue, um, just because that's the most commonly used in the MT community. Um, I mean, the truth is, if you look at the data, like in Google's massively multilingual model, uh, where they show these very large improvements in um, the low resource end of the spectrum, um, and then you look at what languages are, are there, you'll find languages like Luxembourgish or Frisian, which are, you know, very, very related to other very high resource languages. So uh, some of these can be misleading, but I don't think uh, that should discourage you because I have seen a lot of research also, and I have done a lot of research also on actual truly low resource languages and languages that are really difficult to handle. And we see similar improvements. Um, yeah, then the question of, um, I think there was a second part of your question about involving translations, sorry, translators, or, um, what was the second part of the question? Well, it's, it's since you, you're using translators to rate the quality, but you, it's harder to get translators for some of these, right. Which is to begin with as well as the pair. So, um, so it must be very hard to actually get good critique, um, you know, what your quality is. It's essentially the same. As yeah. The, it's just that it, it's more difficult. Yeah, I, I absolutely get that. Um, and the truth is, you know, I, I still operate at an academic setting. I have never actually, well, I did kind of like once in my internship, but um, in an internship, um, I have never actually deployed an empty system with translators specifically to see, you know, what the improvement um, of uh, uh, or in productivity there is. Um, but let me come back to your question because th there are some ideas to take uh, Hector's question. So Hector is asking, I think you'd like to work with Mexican indigenous languages. The government says it is not possible because you have 364 linguistic variants. It is possible. Um, like I know, I know people from Mexico. There was just last week, there was a workshop called Americas NLP at, at the conference that was supposed to happen in Mexico City, but unfortunately happened online. But it will happen in, in Mexico City, hope, I hope next year or the next time that NACO takes place. Um, there are people from UNAM, I want to say, um, like Manuel Mayer, um, who have been uh, basically collecting data for Piwarica. And, and Nahuatl, they've, they've built, for example, Nahuatl to Spanish and Nahuatl to English translation systems. Um, you know, I don't want to speak to why the government says it is not possible, but, you know, if you have data, it is possible. If you have just a little bit of data, it is possible. That's what I'm arguing. And, you know, we have this three year long project that just started where we're going to try and make all of ILA machine readable. So, and in there, there are a lot of languages from Mexico, like Zapotec uh, is one of the ones that we have a lot of PDFs that we're going to try and digitize to, and hopefully we'll be able to provide at least some machine readable data to the community. 
So Hector, if you want, I can I can put you in contact with the people that I know in Mexico who are doing this type of work. If you don't know them already. Uh, this this is Craig. I, I, I had a, a comment and an observation. <clears throat> One of the things that Translation Commons is working really hard on is making it possible for people to generate text. But mm -hmm. this text is going to be very informal. It's going to be on uh, text messages. It's going to be in emails. Um, mm -hmm. And so that brings up the problem of standardization of languages that, that don't have... Uh, much education being done in that mm -hmm. or don't have standardized uh, orthography. So I, I see that there's an explosion of data happening, but that mm -hmm. that data is going to be in a form that's very difficult to use. I wonder if you have any comments about that. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, we are looking into this. Um, it is it is a problem. Um, I have shown in previous work that, for example, just English by a non-native speaker can lead to the degradation in quality for an English to French or English to German system, right? Um, so that's an issue. Uh, but the reason for that is because those systems are trained on clean data, right? They're trained on uh, clean translations that have no noise. So of course, when you present noise to the model, it has never learned to handle it. Now. If you do have data that have noise from the get go and you train on it, the model will learn to handle it. And we can do, we can be a little smarter and incorporate some intuitions. So if two words uh, just differ by a little bit and the, the changes that you're going to get in, um, you know, in the orthographies, they are going to be more or less standard. They want there, if you have a lot of data from different people, you know, uh, you're not going to get a different orthography per person. There's going to be common mistakes, if you, common variants. I don't want to say mistakes, right? So these can be modeled. Um, so I don't even think that standardization is is necessary. If anything, it's on us to build systems that can adequately handle noise, and people are moving in this direction. Great, thank you. That that's very helpful. Yeah. Hi, Julie here. Yes, hi. Um, thank you, Antonis, for your presentation. Um, I have a question about the GitHub link that you mm -hmm. shared. So if a language community mm -hmm. is collecting their language data that they have available, and let's say they have handwritten stuff, and mm -hmm. they even have stuff that was typed with the typewriter years ago, mm -hmm. are you saying this is a tool at, at, in, in this GitHub link that they can attempt to start to make an OCR that will work for their language? Is that what this? Um, so at its current version, the tool is available. We have all the code available, but you need to have some computer experience in order to run it because, or you need a computer scientist to run it just because we haven't made a nice looking interface. Okay. Um, I, we are working on this. <laughs> But it's, it is going to be a year or two before we actually deploy uh, deploy this with a nice interface, uh, because there's also privacy considerations, such as you know um, maybe a community wants to run the tool, but they don't want to give us the data. And in, with this case, mm. we want to make sure that you know when they upload the data on the tool, because everything now will happen on the cloud. You know, they, it, you don't need a good computer. Or they they don't want to run on our servers or whatever. Uh, so that we want to make sure that, you know, if the community doesn't want that, then yeah. we, we won't get access to the data. So if you have someone who knows how to use a terminal and just write commands, and we have mm. commands you need to run, how you should format your data and so on, uh, then yes. If not, um, and you can share the data, we would be more than happy to help with this. I have two students working full time on this. Uh, thanks to the NEH, so <laughs> so um, and we're always looking for you know interesting cases to try our our, our tools on. Um, our ultimate goal with this is if especially we can release the data. So there's the goal of digitizing Isla and making Isla machine readable. But mm -hmm. the other thing we want to do is just get a benchmark that actually covers all of those languages. So even just a few pages 
of a book in many, many, a few pages in many, many languages uh, that will allow us, not just us, to test our OCR tools, but also all the other people doing research in OCR, that we can create such a benchmark so we can drive research and you know direct researchers to actually try uh, building OCR tools for all those languages. Because you know, computer scientists um, in the academia, at least, they need to be able to say, oh yeah, I, I tested on this benchmark, this data set, and I improved upon Adonis's previous model by 1%. And then you get a publication, you, you get bragging rights, uh, you have a goal to, you can do analysis and so on. So we, we want on a, as a side to create a big benchmark. So if you have any communities that have data that they're willing to share, uh, we'd be very happy to talk to them. Thank you very much. Um, it would be great to stay in touch with you because um, the uh, Translation Commons has a project called the Language Digitization yes. Initiative. Yes. You're aware of that. And this will be a very important thing for us to be able to tell people that we are reaching out to who we are trying to guide them through the through all the steps that are needed and uh, to create the technology stack that they need to bring their language online. And so if there are languages that haven't got OCR yet, mm -hmm. um, this would be really um, very important for us to know about. So uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Sure. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. My, I'll put my email here for everyone to grab. Um, and then maybe we should go back to Pex, even though I don't see any other hands. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the um, issue of uh, indigenous communities wanting privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I was just, because we've been discussing this with, within this group as well, um, you know, how to, how to become more trustworthy and, and so forth mm -hmm. in lives of these communities. But I was just wondering if um, you had any particular insights into that or things that we could do to mitigate um, that issue. Um, you just kind of open-ended if, if you don't. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, okay, from a computer scientist's perspective where we do everything these days open source, um, like every paper we write, we, we put the data out and we put the code out for people to be able to reproduce our experiments and build something on top of that if they need. Um, initially, it seemed weird that, you know, in the linguistics community, you just keep the data to yourself. And then I went to uh, ICLDC uh, workshop on documentation linguistics um, in Hawaii. And then I talked to community members. and They were like, well, linguists came, took data, published their papers, built their careers, and then gave nothing back. So, I mean, from that perspective, it actually makes a lot of sense to not want to give them anything for free. What I would argue, and um, I mean, it kind of worked with the community in Angola that we're working with now, is that, hey, if you spend the effort to create some data, then first of all, um, my goal will be to release the data out there so that, you know, Google can support Kimbundu in, in tra Google Translate. Microsoft can take the data and support Kimbundu in Bing Translate. Um, maybe they can create keyboards uh, I'm, I'm, if they don't have already on the language and so on. And at least for on my part, I, what we said with this community was like, hey, we're going to maybe try and build an app that will help with uh, literacy efforts. So in, in the case of this OCR, the idea was, oh, hey, maybe we can teach people, uh, because now they are teaching people to write by driving to villages once a month. But if you have an app, maybe you can have people write on paper and then take a photo, and then we have the OCR recognize and tell them if they made a mistake or not, something like that. Uh, we're still figuring this out, but basically uh, we find that every community wants to know what they will get back. And from a computer scientist perspective, I would say, well, you won't get something immediately right now because, you know, after you put the data, it takes some, some effort or maybe a little bit of effort to actually create those tools, but eventually you'll get those tools. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that was the issue that I've heard from the communities. It wasn't that there was no give back. It was that um, people actually, people outside the community actually took ownership of the data 
and uh, then it became uh, difficult to to use, or and it or it morphed into something that didn't represent the language. Right. But right. Thank you for the comments. I I want to make sure other people get a chance to talk if there are more questions and respect time. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Craig, I, I just had a comment. Um, it sounds like all of th this is wonderful work um, for many indigenous communities that do have some technical uh, skills, especially young people who are learning basic computer things. Um, in addition to scientific papers, uh, I wonder if there are short tutorials being created, like a, a half hour YouTube video on how mm -hmm. to do OCR correction or half hour video on how to start putting data in for these models. Yes. Um, so we, I think you're right. We, we have a video of a presentation that describes the model, but we don't have a tutorial. And I think that would be something that would be very useful to do for sure, at least for the OCR thing uh, that we have built uh, for building machine translation systems that uh, are on top of these large pre-trained models, there actually is a, I don't want to say a small startup, but these days it's pretty big. It's called Hugging Face, like named after the Hugging Face emoji, which is, it has offices in Paris and in New York, but basically they've been creating simple interfaces, um, again, through Python. So you need to know Python, a uh, programming language, uh, that but they have very nice tutorials. They just put out a, an introductory course on how to do NLP with their tools. And they have all of these large pre-trained models. They have the code for fine tuning. So essentially all you need to do is know how to write or copy even uh, 10 lines of Python, uh, format your data in the appropriate, uh, you know, the, the necessary format and then just run the code and then you'll end up with a model that's fine-tuned for the language of your choice. And, you know, it may work or it might not work or it might be great or it might be just okay, you know? Uh, but um, th that's one of the places that I would look into. And honestly, if you search, um, you know, for, to, you know, how to, how to fine-tune um, MBART, one of those large, um, pre-trained models that Facebook put out, then there's going to be like 10 medium articles of varying quality and with varying explanations on how to do this. Uh, for the OCR, I, I absolutely would take your suggestion back to my student and we'll look into creating a, a walkthrough video of all the steps required. We've already done this like three or four times with communities that are, we're working with now in a one-to-one -one fashion. Uh, so we might as well actually create a tutorial for this. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would like to add, in, if, if you're not aware, Antonis, um, we've produced some v videos. Julie um, has created a great video on data gathering. Um, mm -hmm. Go to our YouTube site. You can take a look at that. But if you, um, and we're producing a whole bunch more of tutorials and videos now. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the in the process of doing that, but if you create some videos for your tools, we'd be happy to post them and make them a okay. part of, of our series. And um, Jeanette or I can coordinate with you on that. It would be great. Absolutely, yeah. To, I, to, I would... to help help communities know how to know about the tools and how to use them. Yes, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. Um, was there, um, if there isn't anything else, um, I mean, I'd be happy to stick around, uh, talk about whatever. Again, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'd be very happy to to work with you or to have my students work with you or have my students work with your students, whatever, um, or with your, if not students, with, with you or your community members. Um, and, or not just me, there, there are lots of people now realizing that oh, hey, we cannot beat Google in building English to French machine translation systems, but we can build Cherokee to English machine translation systems or Cherokee to Spanish or whatever systems. So a lot of academics are moving in this multilinguality space and low resource uh, realm. Um, so the, you, I, I can also give you pointers to people uh, that might be more local uh, depending on where you are. Um, and, you know, 
Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Thank, I, thank I, you, Antonis. Um, so on behalf of everyone, uh, maybe if you want to turn on your mics and give him some applause or, or kudos. Thank you. I hope I only I can only hope that we'll end up succeeding in our goal of building NLP tools for all six thousand languages of the world. That would be great. And very <laughs> Thank you. Right, Thank thanks. you. Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Pardon, text. Thank you. I, I, I have a comment or question. Um, one of the problems I think is with uh, Google Translate is that many people around the world assume that that's the only system available for them. And I wonder if there's a way to um, not only do this work, but make even preliminary versions easily available public. So if I look up Translate uh, Fula, mm -hmm. will I find a website that lets me do it. Yes, um, that we realize this, and the community have realized this. So the Mashakane community, for instance, in Africa, not only build tools, but they also pulled up an interface that now allows them to do font to French translation, for instance. All of the models that they have, um, and um, a group in Ireland has done the same. So we have the infrastructure to do this. Not a lot of people do that, but now we are realizing more and more that it is necessary. Um, so uh, the, the, the short answer is not everybody does this, but it is possible and more people should be doing this. And I'm, I'm going to be encouraging my students to try and do this too, or uh, if we end up building tools, it won't be just a, about writing a paper, but also about giving back, as I said. To the community. Should, I, should I talk to my colleagues at Google and say that uh, it, that they should put something on the Google Translate website that says your language is here. Um, look at these other possibilities. I mean, I'm not going to say no. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked with people at Google. I don't know if you know Dan Panesh. Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah, obviously. He's doing amazing work. He's not in the Translate team. I mean, I understand, of course, the requirements. Like, we don't want to put a system that will be good 50% of the time and spew out garbage. 50% of the time when you're go when you're Google, right? Uh, if an academic does it, it doesn't, you know, no, I mean, there will be harm if someone uses the output, but there won't be any publicity, um, you know, there won't be any social media warriors coming after me. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, I mean, I think it would be reasonable if Google wants to do this, absolutely. Like, hey, you know, Chosa is not covered or Kenya Rwanda is, I'm just throwing out names. He's not covered. Um, but here's a tool that Mashakane put out. And Google supports Mashakane also financially. So um, um, it, it would make sense to do this. I just, I just did a, uh, a search, machine translation tools that are not Google Translate. And, <laughs> and I get a few, but they, they're mostly uh, Wikipedia articles or general articles, but they are not actually pointing to places where people could Type in Cherokee and get out Spanish. Right, right. Let me try and find the font to French interface Mashakan put out. Because I'm thinking there must be many websites that language communities have created over the years where they have a word lookup dictionary, translation dictionary. It's just posted to a website. And um, I don't even know if it's in Unicode or not. Maybe not. But but how do people find these? You know what I mean? There isn't there isn't sort of one unified way to find these. I don't know how. I mean, this would take a lot of a lot of looking. Yes, it to does. Find it these. Does. <laughs> yes, and that's why I mean, even more. Not even go, don't even care about translation. Let's say one of the most basic NLP tasks: language ID. Oh, like, yes. You see a text. What language is it in? Um, Google has been doing amazing work, for example, in putting out tools that in theory support hundreds of languages, but because they had to rely on web pages and things like that, uh, there were some recent studies that showed that they, they were actually just not accurate at all for, 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 lower, for, for underserved and, you know, for these under-resourced languages. So I think Dan from Google was also thinking about creating some sort of resource that says, hey, this web page 
is definitely Sicilian. Mm -hmm. His web page is definitely Nahuatl, so that we can actually get, um, and you know, we need the input from the community about this. I don't know where I can find web pages in Urdu, I mean, or Kashmiri or whatever, but uh, a community member would know, right? And, about, and it's it's complicated. I I I used I did this at Pamlex. This was my yeah part I've of my job. Super, super, super cool. Yeah, was the identifying for sure what ISO code to use because we couldn't use the data unless we could have be confident about that ISO code. And so it would take some digging and even triangulating, you know, like look at the preface of the dictionary where the linguist is describing this language is spoken, you know, in a villa in villages that are two miles south of this mountain and three miles west of this river. And then I go to Google Maps and then I go to, you know, ethnologue and glottologue and, yeah. and, and look at other clues and look at other data somewhere else that shows how you count from one to 10 in that language. It doesn't match up. So it's, I mean, to my way of thinking, that is, it, it's, that's a complicated thing for, no, for, for humans, you yeah. know. And, uh, and and also the most fun part of the job, so. <laughs> so yeah, so, that, so that's an issue, that, that the fact that, you know, we don't actually know what's out there is an issue, right? So um, there, there and just going to the community is so important. I'll go back to the Greco community, uh, which has about 20,000 speakers, okay? For a while, there was support by the Greek government. There was some revitalization efforts. But nevertheless, the language is very much in danger today, mostly because all of the young people moved from the south of Italy because there were no jobs. So they just, you know, they are now out of the region and they have to use modern Italian. Um, so we went there with the linguists as I was an undergrad and my job as an electrical engineer was just to build a database for the data that we're going to collect. I, I hadn't thought about NLP or linguistics at the time. And we went there and we met people like at the cafe at the main square who took us to their house and they were like, Hey, I have these recordings that I've been collecting for like 10 years that my wife was mocking me about, but Hey, look wife, there's these people from Greece who can now use this data and do something useful with it, you know, and you know, we won't have gotten this data unless you actually talk to the communities. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of effort, obviously. Um, and that's what, I, for me as a computer scientist, I, I almost always just work with a linguist that has the ties to the communities because, you know, what can I do from Washington, D.C. Or, or from Athens, you know? Um, right. So, right. And we're, yeah, we're, it's super important. Yeah. And we're embarking on an outreach effort. I don't know what shape it will take. There are so many languages in the world and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know what shape that will take, but um, anyway, I, I, that's why I'm thinking in terms of that GitHub link that you shared and um, what um, we can I offer people. Just, uh, put it here. I don't know if you, um, you probably had it. Had it I wrote it. it. I actually, actually wrote it out. Okay, I'll put it here. Um, it's the whole project page. We're gonna we have an updated version of our tool that works even better. Uh, that's under review, uh, but um, we are gonna try and go ahead and put out a tutorial after Shruti, the student who did most of the work, uh, defends her proposal, um, so that we can actually go ahead and um, um, make this as accessible as possible. But meanwhile, if you have stuff that you need to do, uh, just email us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued by this talk for a variety of reasons. One of them is that uh, my first contact with a, a smaller language community was with the Cherokee years ago. Oh, okay. I actually met someone by accident and uh, we started talking and he said, uh, because I said I work with languages, he introduced me to people in the Cherokee Nation and, and uh, um, we, we launched Google search in Cherokee, for example, with the Cherokee mm -hmm. and user interfaces in, in smaller languages are, are not all that useful to the community, except as a affirmation that their mm -hmm. language is important. Yeah. Um, and that effort, um, to get more 
more translated user interfaces has has not gone very far because it's very expensive, and and people don't use them even when we write it for quite a number of African languages, for example, because many people don't read and write in those languages. Yeah, I. Okay. Yeah, but um, but the language the language interest is is growing. Um, I work with uh, I, I I try to coordinate with uh, the Google uh, input tools group uh, Gboard. And I think that most important areas where we can make an impact fairly easily if people realize that oh there's a way of typing their languages. Um, but the uh, one of the big problems that's arisen there is again people finding out whether the tool is available mm -hmm. um, assuming that it isn't and so not even looking and the second thing is that um, for many of these languages people will say oh this is a Cree language keyboard but that doesn't work because there isn't one Cree language there are, there are a bunch of Cree languages which use which use different writing systems use very different vocabularies so the um, you pointed out many of the opportunities but uh, um, the practical, the practical things um, come up very quickly as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I do acknowledge all of those. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, shall I assume that you're in touch with some some OCR people at Google? Um, mostly done. Um, oh, okay. Um, but, there, there, yeah. there's, there's another person in that team I, I could check with and see if he would be willing to be in touch with you. Absolutely. Yeah, would be more than happy. We, we are using. Uh, Google as our first plus output because it is the best thing out there <laughs> that we found. So, and I, I didn't mean to dunk on Google or anything. I, I did two internships there and I absolutely loved it in New York. So, no, no, no offense taken. We, uh, we're, we're uh, I'm, I'm only one part of a big company and a big company does mm -hmm. some great things and does some things uh, badly and doesn't do a lot of things. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, we, have, um, we do have we, we do have an active OCR team, I believe, in, in Mountain View, and uh, right. expert in that area. Um, my, I'll, I'll see if they're uh, willing to be in contact with you. How about yes, that? Yes, that'd be that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, I did put the link to the Cherokee English translation paper um, in the chat. Yes, I see that. Thank you. Uh, it's more yeah. he consult with the CS person. Uh, he worked with a linguist again. I think at UNC. Um, who collected the data and a student who's a native speaker. But I absolutely agree with you. And I do want to mention that, you know, um, two things. One is that there's a lot of interest these days on speech translation so that people don't actually need to write. Um, yes. We organize the share task for speech, like, you know, audio translation for Swahili, uh, for two varieties, Postal and Congolese Swahili. Um, and you can get decent output with with some effort. We we pay the translators without borders to actually record for us some data and create uh, a, both an evaluation set and a small training set. Um, so, you know, the, I I you know from my view, you know, if the language is oral, then it falls on us to create tools that will be able to work with audio and not work with text. Um, and there are calls in the NLP community towards that end. Um, I mean, I'm, honestly, I'm planning to submit a proposal at some point for oral NLP tools, uh, but you know, there's so much work to do and so little time. And it's not just me, but there's other people looking at this, uh, especially for speech translation. You know, uh, it we it comes back to, to what is what I uh, what I talked about in the talk. You know, uh, Skype supports speech to speech translation between English and Spanish and it's decent and it was trained on a ton of data like several hundreds of hours of translated audio um, and it was assumed that in order to reach that level of accuracy or, or that level of recent accuracy you needed that amount of data in any language but with all these improvements with these multilingual models uh this pre-training that I didn't talk about and so on now um People are training speech recognition tools with just 10 minutes of audio transcribed. And it's decent, right? Not in English because it has weird phonology, but it's decent in all the other languages. Um, and, you know, obviously, and the same goes for speech translation. So there's, you know, there's a lot of promise, I think, that, you know, as speech translation is not there yet, but if you check again in a, in a year, it will be there.
Yeah, you're, you're probably familiar with um, the work that Don Van Esch and the people in Australia have done on a project called Elpis. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And that that has that that's very exciting and has a lot of promise. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I I actually just saw Don a couple of weeks ago at a workshop for African documentation linguists who wanted to use uh, our talk. And Don talked about Elpis, and I talked about again. I gave an introductory talk and I talked about the OCR stuff. So. Yes, there's there's lots of nice initiatives going thank, on. Thank you.